still got a couple more people trickling in through the waiting room, but tonight we're going to continue our reaching out while locked in beef management series. Um, some of the initial feedback we got from you all was that you wanted um, some forages discussion. And so we have uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Toich with us, who's the forage specialist with the University of Kentucky. Uh, he works down in Princeton at the UK Research and Education Center with me. Um, so we thought he'd be a great addition to our lineup tonight. And so to, he's going to talk to you all about approaches for reclaiming hay feeding areas. And as always, just pop questions into the chat if you've got them, and we'll try to get those addressed at the end. All right. Thank you, Katie. You go ahead. And uh, please, please feel free to. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. It's a yep. pleasure to be with you all tonight. I'm going to talk about approaches to reclaiming hay feeding areas. Um, you know, after we go through very, very wet and long winters, we have a lot of damage, especially where we are feeding hay or silage or uh, concentrate feed in pastures. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about a couple different approaches to reclaiming these, these areas. You know, naturally, um, we're going to see hoof damage in pastures as we go through a long and wet winter. And, and generally speaking, as we get closer to hay feeding areas, that damage is going to be more severe. And uh, that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about tonight is, is how do we quantify this damage and then how do we respond in terms of uh, reclaiming or renovating these hay feeding areas especially? And that's what I'm gonna focus on tonight is these drastically disturbed hay feeding areas. I always like to tell people um, to, to really step back and, and take a look when they think of, that their pasture is completely damaged. A lot of times when you move away from these hay feeding areas, the damage isn't quite as bad as, as you think. So just getting people to step back and take a look is important. And there's several ways to, to quantify this damage. And um, I like to take a quadrat and just throw it out at a few places as you move away from the hay feeding area uh, where you have 100% soil disturbance. And a lot of times the damage is not quite as severe as people think. But we can quantify it by looking at the amount of disturbance in the quadrat and then the depth of that disturbance. Uh, the deeper the disturbance, the more severe the damage is going to be. And generally speaking, when we move into a hay feeding area, we're going to have near 100% disturbance and very deep treading damage in those areas. And this is a publication that was out of New Zealand, and it kind of puts together the depth of the damage and then how severe that disturbance is. And uh, kind of categorizes whether you have very light damage or moderate damage or severe damage or very severe damage. Generally speaking, in, in terms of hay feeding areas, we're gonna be in this 100% this disturbance range in, in very deep damage. So, so we're gonna have very severe damage in these hay feeding areas. Once you know the, the severity of the damage, you can kind of develop a plan to either rehabilitate that pasture or that hay feeding area. Tonight, we're gonna to concentrate primarily on severe and very severe damage. And we're gonna go, go through some options to reclaim that hay feeding area. So when we look at severe and, and, and very severe damage, um, regardless of the approach that we're gonna use, and we're gonna talk about three approaches tonight to reclaiming these areas, we want to start out and, and make sure that our soil fertility is where it needs to be. Usually in these areas, we're going to have a, a, a high level of fertility because there's all the hay and the concentrate feed or silage that was deposited there and it's kind of rotting and breaking down in the soil and that's going to add fertility. Plus we tend to get high levels of, of manure and urine concentration in these areas, which is going to let, raise fertility. So normally our fertility is pretty good. The one thing that um, feeding hay or concentrate feed does not do is increase soil pH. So we want to make sure we take a soil test and just make sure that our pH is where it needs to be in that um, hay feeding area in, in adjacent pastures. 
we're going to have a significant amount of, of soil disturbance in these hay feeding areas, normally close to 100%, or sometimes it seems even like more than 100% soil disturbance. Um, we're going to need to get in there and, and kind of clean that area up. It's going to be a very rough surface, not conducive to uh, reclamation or reseeding. Uh, we're going to need to smooth it and level it, usually with some type of tillage, um, a disc harrow, a drag, um, a field cultivator, some, some type of tillage to get things leveled out and smoothed up. Ideally, we want to have a, a fine and firm seed bed. Um, when we have a seed bed that's full of clot, clots of um, dried uh, dirt, we don't get good soil to seed contact and we get poor germination and um, poor emergence from whatever we plant in that seed bed. So our goal to, should be to have a fine but firm seed bed that's going to enhance soil to seed contact and help get a uniform and rapid emergence of whatever we decide to plant into that seed bed. We're going to talk about three approaches to reclamation of these grassly disturbed hay feeding areas tonight. And um, the first one is to use a cool season annuals planted in the spring. The second one is to establish cool season perennials. That would include things like tall fescue and orchard grass. And the last one that we'll talk about is establishing warm season annuals. And we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each one of these different approaches. And, and really, there's no right or wrong approach. Some tend to work more, um, more consistently uh, than others. So let's talk about the first option, and that's to use cool season annuals. And cool season annuals include things like our small grains, uh, winter wheat, cereal rye, um, a spring oat, and maybe annual ryegrass. Most of these, with the exception of a spring oat, are normally planted in the fall. And, and what we're trying to do here is plant these cool season annuals in the spring. And, and sometimes it, it works and sometimes it doesn't work quite as good as we think it should. We would be establishing these in mid-April to mid-May, so, so by the time we get animals um, through winter and, and let the pastures grow out a little bit in the spring, we're talking probably, depending on the year, you know, mid-April to early May in most years, sometimes a little bit later, uh, depending on the spring. So, so we're getting these um, animals back on pastures. We're trying to get these cool season annuals established as quickly as possible. It's going to take a little while to get things dried out and cleaned up and smoothed out and seeded. So, so in reality, we're probably looking at, er, at the earliest of around um, early May to mid-May before these get established. So that's really going to give us a limited window of productivity for these cool season annuals. Remember, they're cool season uh, forage species. And what that means is that their productivity is going to be highest when the, the air temperature, the temperature of the leaf blade is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Quickly, as we move through May, we're going to be increasing temperature fairly rapidly. And as we get into the beginning of June, the productivity of these cool season annuals is going to decrease dramatically. So we really have a lim limited window in which these cool season annuals can be productive. And, and they're definitely not going to be productive during the summer months. As, as we exceed that leaf temperature of around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the photosynthetic rate in these cool season uh, forages, whether they're annual or perennial, goes down. And if they're not productive during the summer months, that means they're not actively competing with summer annual weeds. And a lot of the weeds that we see in these uh, drastically disturbed areas include things like spiny amaranth and cockleburr, um, goosegrass, and, and foxtail. These cool season annuals just will not be competing for space and, and helping to keep these summer annual weeds from germinating. So in, in my opinion, I, I don't think cool season annuals um, are, are really a, a good option for reclaiming these areas because of that short time span in which they're really productive. 
we're asking them to get up and be productive within a, a 45 to 60 day time span. And that's just not going to provide us a, a lot of summer cover and helping to keep summer annual weeds from germinating. So I don't think this first option is really the best option, but I definitely wanted to address it because people ask about this option all the time. So let's move on to option number two, and, and that's reseeding or reestablishing these cool season perennials that got disturbed during the winter months around these hay feeding areas. Um, in cool, typical cool season perennials that we could reestablish include things like tall fescue. Tall fescue is by far our best adapted cool season grass. Orchard grass, um, perennial ryegrass, Perennial ryegrass is adapted to Kentucky, but it, it kind of behaves like a short-lived perennial. So it'll be productive maybe two, two years or so um, before it's disturbed again. And then uh, before it, it tends to go away. And then we have red and white clover, which are our best adapted forage legumes. Um, one of the important things to remember when you're selecting a cool season perennial for these hay feeding areas is that if if you're going to be refeeding re hay in those areas again that following winter, then it, it may not pay you to buy the best gen forage genetics. So if we know that we're going to come back in, in in early winter that same year and disturb that area again, then um, spending money on something like a novel endophyte tall fescue, which could cost four or five dollars a pound, is, is probably not the best investment when you could get a cheaper variety of tall fescue at you know half or a third of the price. So we would come in with these cool season perennials and, and again we're not going to get the animals off those pastures until probably around mid-April um, or those hay feeding areas and back on the pasture until around mid-April. So by the time we get these cool season um, perennials established we're looking at beginning of May to mid-May in most cases. Um, the, the problem is, is that we've got, again, like the cool season annuals, we've got a limited period of growth before it gets hot with these cool season perennials. And a lot of times they won't have enough time to get a, a strong root system established before going into the summer months. And that can cause stand failures. The other thing to remember is they're not as competitive with summer annual weeds. Again, as, we, as the temperature increases, their growth rate decreases. Um, because they are a, a C3 or a cool season grass. Um, so they're not actively competing with these summer annual weeds and that can cause um, real bad infestations of summer annual weeds, which can lead to stand failures of these cool season perennials that we're trying to plant in late spring or early summer. So if, if you're gonna try to reseed cool season grasses in the spring, I, these are some tips um, to enhance success with these uh, cool season perennials. And the first one is the seed as early as possible. If, if you look at our, our um, crop uh, publication of forage crops and grain crops in, in Kentucky, we'll see that this ideal seeding window would be somewhere between mid-February and mid-April. And, and really we're already starting behind because we're not going to be seeding until in best case scenario around the beginning of May. So, so we're already a little bit behind the ideal seeding window with these cool season uh, perennial forages uh, when we're trying to reestablish these hay feeding areas. Uh, another tip is to consider leaving legumes out. A lot of times we like to seed a red and white clover, which are important parts of pasture ecosystems because they're legumes that bring nitrogen into that grazing system. But it limits our ability to control broadleaf weeds with something like 2,4-D or dicamba or graze on next uh, during the summer months. Um, and when we can't control those broadleaf weeds like spiny amaranth, um, we, we often will shade out our, our cool season perennial forages that we established. We wanna use the high end of the seeding rate and make sure that we calibrate the drill. If that, to make sure that we're putting out the, the desired seeding rate. There's a nice video on our Master Grazer website on drill calibration. It's a very simple method. It can be used universally across all grain drills. 
and there's uh, a YouTube video on our uh, Master Grazer website and also on our KY Forages YouTube channel. Um, plant in two directions. So, so the idea is, is that we cut the seeding rate in half if we're drilling and when we drill in two di directions. It can either be perpendicular or kind of at a diagonal, but we want to spread the same amount of seed out over a larger area and get quicker canopy closure. One of the things that we can do to limit uh, weed germination um, is get quick canopy closure that helps prevent those summer annual weeds from germinating. And then seeding depth is important. The seed bed will be pretty soft, so we want to make sure we're not putting seed deeper than about a half an inch into that seed bed. If we go deeper than that with these small seeded uh, cool season perennial forages, um, we tend to get uh, poor emergence from the soil and um, on stands that are not uniform. And then we want to control weeds. And again, if we have a mixture of a grass and legume, our weed control options are, are pretty limited. There's no herbicides that we can apply to a mixture of a grass and legume. In that case, we have to use cultural practices such as flash grazing. That's when we turn animals in, a large number of animals on a small area for a short period of time and let them graze the weeds off to keep that canopy open and let light into those developing perennial cool season forages. Uh, we can also clip with a, um, a bush hog uh, to, to help control weeds. These are some seeding rates uh, for the different species that we mentioned before. And there's seeding rates for seeding them alone or in a mixture. Um, and we can seed multiple grasses together and multiple legumes together in a mixture uh, if we so desire. And again, if we add legumes, then we limit our weed control options in terms of herbicides. Um, one thing that I want to mention here, I'm not going to go through all these, these seeding rates, but, but we want to tend to stay towards the higher end of the seeding rate when we're reclaiming these drastically disturbed uh, hay feeding areas to get more rapid canopy closure. So I wanna move into the, the third option. And I think this option is probably the most viable for reclaiming these really drastically disturbed hay feeding areas. And this option involves using warm season annual grasses uh, or summer annual grasses. They include things like sorghum Sudan grass, uh, Sudan grass, pearl millet, and, and even crabgrass, a uh, forage type of crabgrass. The sorghum Sudan grasses and Sudan grasses um, are, are the fastest emerging and probably will give us the most uniform stands and the quickest canopy closure, which will help prevent the germination of summer annual weeds. We would establish them in, in early May to mid-June would be the ideal period. Optimally, you want to have the soil temperature to be around 60 to 65 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. You don't gain much by seeding a warm season annual legume too early. Um, they're going to have optimal growth during the summer months when those summer annual weeds are actively growing, so they're going to give them good competition. Um, we're going to get rapid emergence and canopy closure. And remember that canopy closure is important to prevent other weeds, summer annual weeds, from germinating and um, becoming established. And they're going to be very competitive, the most competitive with summer annual weeds. These are some seeding rates for different um, summer annuals that we could use uh, for reclaiming these uh, areas. And, and what I want to mention about these is, again, we want to stay towards the high end of the seeding rate. And, and crabgrass can be seeded alone at about five or six pounds an acre, or we could seed two to three pounds of crabgrass with these taller growing summer annual legumes to help fill in the understory in any areas that we may not get a good stand of the um, taller growing summer annual uh, grasses. So just a few tips to enhance the success when you're using these summer annual grasses. Um, we want to seed after the soil is warm. So again, when the soil temperature gets 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 
A good general rule for this time of the year is if we look at nighttime temperatures, we want the nighttime temperatures to be staying around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's a good general rule to tell us that our soil temperatures are going to be ideal for seeding these warm season annually grasses. We want to use the high end of the seeding rate and make sure we calibrate our drill to, to know how much seed we're putting out, plant in two directions. Um, we can seed a little bit deeper with um, sorghum Sudan grass and Sudan grass up to about an inch to an inch and a half. With, with crab grass, we want to be down uh, at a quarter inch or less. Um, and with pearl millet, we'd like to be at about a half an inch would be ideal. Um, we want to control weeds. And if we have a, a pure sand and just grass, then we can use some herbicides. And we can start grazing at 18 to 25 inches tall for our taller growing um, summer annual grasses like pearl millet and sorghum sudan and sudan grass. And if we're going to cut hay off of these areas, we can cut hay at about 30 to 40 inches, and that's going to optimize our yield and forage quality. And then we can come back in the fall and, and reestablish cool season perennial grasses in, in these areas when the seeding conditions are more optimal for cool season perennial grasses. Now, if we're going to feed hay in these areas again, we could come in in late summer with something like annual ryegrass or a small grain and seed that to get some cover during the winter months, realizing that it will be disturbed uh, as the animals go through the winter months. So just thinking a little bit outside of the, the more traditional summer annual forage species, I want to talk just a little bit about crabgrass. And, we did a nice demonstration last summer on a farm in Ohio County where we had a field day that had a crabgrass red clover mixture. And we got a real nice stand. We seeded it in um, uh, early June for the field day. The ideal period would be somewhere from early May to mid June. And we can uh, smooth the seed bed up with a little bit of tillage on these disturbed areas and then broadcast on three to five pounds of crabgrass and six to eight pounds of red clover. And you can even add a little bit of annual espadiza if you like at a five to six pound rate. And then come in and get that seed in contact with the soil. And ideally we would, we would call to pack that seed bed, to press that seed in contact with the soil. Or we could use a, a light drag across the top of it. Or we could turn some animals in and let them kind of uh, work, work the seed in with their hoof action. Uh, probably not the best way call to packing would be better. Um, and then we can come in and graze or, or hay the crabgrass during the summer months and then come back in in the fall in either uh, plant a perennial cool season grass or an annual cool season grass. Again, if the area is going to be used for hay feeding again um, in the uh, winter months, then seeding an annual cool season grass may be a better option than a perennial. All right, just a little bit more about crabgrass. It's really well adapted to the Mid-South. It, it's truly a warm season annual grass. That means it's got to come back from seed every year, but it acts like a perennial through prolific reseeding. So that means it just produces a bunch of seed during the summer months. And an important management strategy for crabgrass is to make sure and let it go to seed one time uh, during the summer months, and then that seed will be next year's crop. We can double crop it with a winter annual, like an annual ryegrass makes a very nice combination with uh, crabgrass. It's productive when crabgrass is not productive. has good yield potential, but where it really excels at is forage quality. Um, average daily gains on crabgrass will range in a pound and a half to two pounds with no supplement. No prussic acid like a sorghum sudan or a sudan grass. This is actually um, one of the first studies I did right out of graduate school. And this was in the uh, south side of Virginia. This was a um, crabgrass study looking at nitrogen fertilization rates for crabgrass. This was 60 days after planting. Those are 30 inch flags. So the crabgrass was a solid uh, two feet tall um, in this particular study about 60 days after seeding. At that time, the only variety that was available was Red River crabgrass. 
since then, there's, there's about a half a dozen different varieties of approved crabgrass on the market. And approved crabgrasses tend to have higher yields, larger leaves, um, and, and generally more upright growth than uh, what we would call a native or an ecotype of crabgrass. All these crabgrass varieties are pretty good. Red River is still one of my favorite crabgrass varieties. Um, Mojo from Baron Brug Seed is a blend of Red River in another variety called Impact from the Noble Foundation. The nice thing about the Mojo is that it comes coated with the clay coating and it's much easier to get to move through a drill um, than some of the other crabgrass varieties. The other crabgrass varieties um, need to be mixed with some type of a carrier like a fertilizer or a pelleted limestone or um, uh, another type of seed to get it to flow through the drill well because they tend to bridge in the drill or cedar. Um, this is a response of crabgrass to nitrogen fertilization. And, and the reason I'm showing you this is, is I just want people to realize that like other summer annual grasses, crabgrass is going to respond to nitrogen in, in several ways. It's going to increase yield and it's also going to increase uh, crude protein concentration in that forage. We have maximum yield over a multiple year period at 305 pounds of nitrogen per acre with crabgrass. Don't, don't ever put 305 pounds of nitrogen on crabgrass. You want to be down here on the straight part of the curve. And that's going to be in that, that 100 to 150 pounds applied to split application, several split applications of nitrogen. Um, where crabgrass really excels is forage quality. We did some work um, that had 75 to 90% in vitro digestibility. Our crude protein ranged between 6 and 14%. 6% was on the end of the growing season when it was senescing or dying off um, at first frost. In, in growing season, it ranged between 10 and 14% depending on nitrogen fertilization. This is an, um, there's an interesting summary of average daily gain for stalker calves that was done at the Noble Foundation. It's in a publication by Dalrymple that was published in the mid-1990s. And what he found was on what he called medium quality crabgrass, so not the best and not the worst. You know, he had about a pound and eight tenths a day average daily gain on just crabgrass. So the quality is very good. And the head to head comparison that was done um, in Oklahoma, they had one pound of average daily gain on Bermuda grass versus a pound and three quarters on crabgrass. So Bermuda grass is another summer forage that could be used. Um, but generally speaking, young performance will be less than a summer annual grass. I just wanted to kind of finish things up tonight and uh, talk a little bit about some summer annual demonstrations we did several years ago in Western Kentucky. Uh, it was the first summer that I was here. Um, we have six locations in, and we worked with the extension agents to identify a producer to work with in those counties. Uh, in, in really good interactions with both the extension agents and the producers in these uh, different counties across Western Kentucky. We put out four treatments on these farms. We had a BMR Sudan grass. If you're not familiar with BMR, that stands for the brown mid rib. And that's a, a trait that's a phenotypic or a physical expression of something that's different within this, within a Sudan grass or a sorghum Sudan grass. The midrib of the leaf is a brown or a tannish color, and that indicates lower lignin levels within that plant, making that grass more digestible in the rumen of the animal, which enhances animal performance. Uh, we had a pearl millet, um, and then we had a forage soybean, large lad, and then a Sudan grass millet soybean combination. And we planted the, each of these four treatments on these six different farms in Western Kentucky. In, uh, up here in the first photograph is uh, my summer interns that first year that I was here, uh, Hunter Adams and Jessica Buckman. This is a young man helped us calibrate the drill at one of our locations. And then uh, this is another location in uh, Crittenden County where we planted um, uh, one of the demonstration sites. 
and I'm just going to show you some observations and then just a little bit of data. But but one of the observations that we made, uh, and I put soybeans in for for my uh, extension friend Adam Barnes, who loves forage soybeans, and uh, the soybeans really struggled if if we didn't control weeds in them. And in most cases, um, people probably would not control weeds. This particular stand was in Hopkins County, and it was really struggling with um, summer annual weeds, uh, mostly grasses here. These soybeans were Roundup ready, so Daryl Simpson came back and sprayed these beans over the top with some glyphosate, and that really released these beans and allowed them to form a good stand. Um, most of the other sites, the soybeans really struggled with summer annual grasses and uh, broadleaf weeds. They're just a little bit slower to get out of the ground and, and get canopy closure than, than a sorghum Sudan grass or a Sudan grass would be. The, the nice and interesting observation was that native crabgrass uh, filled in a lot of the gaps between those soybeans, especially at the, the Caldwell County location, and um, actually provided some good grazing um, along with those soybeans. At the, Hopkins County location, we had a treatment that was a combination of crabgrass and annual lespedeza mixed together, and we seeded that over a, a hay feeding area. And uh, we had a, got a really nice stand. One of the observations with the crabgrass was it wasn't quite as aggressive as, at getting out of the ground. We tended to have a higher weed concentration in the crabgrass annual lespedeza mixture compared with the sorghum Sudan grass. Um, this is a nice illustration of, of how important seeding depth is. Uh, this was at the Hopkins County location, and, and I'll just um, say for the full disclosure, I was not there when this was seeded. This was my two interns and, and uh, the producer and extension agent seeded this. They seeded a pass of pearl millet, which tends to have a smaller seed than sorghum Sudan grass. And, um, and they decided that it wasn't going deep enough in the soil and they readjusted the drill and uh, putting the seed deeper in the soil. And this first pass that had a shallower seeding depth came up and made a really nice stand. The subsequent passes you can see on either side did not come up because that seed went too deep in the soil. So, so it, wasn't, it was a great demonstration for the importance of not seeding too deep uh, with these small seeded forage crops. In all the locations, the Sudan grass established uh, most quickly. Um, it had good canopy closure and shaded the weeds out um, on these uh, drastically disturbed areas. So, so I think my first choice for you know, summer annual species to revegetate these areas would be a, a Sudan grass or a sorghum Sudan grass, just because it gets out of the ground so quickly and forms a canopy so quickly and keep some annual weeds from germinating. And uh, this is Jessica Buckman with me uh, at, at our location in um, Ballard County. And uh, she's posing with the BMR um, Sudan grass. Uh, it's palatable and, and nutritious for livestock. This is from the Webster County location. This is a pretty, stark um, image in terms of what a Sudan grass can do in terms of wheat suppression. And on the right, we had the mixture of millet and forage soybean and Sudan grass, and we just had a much higher wheat load with that mixture versus the Sudan grass on the left. And we sampled the plots and, and took a first harvest yield before the producers grazed these plots at each one of the locations. And I'll just show you some of that productivity data. So what we can see here is that the productivity of the soybean was much lower, around 2,000 pounds of dry matter, versus the other summer annuals that had a production of in that four to 5,000 pound range. So a very, very good yield at that first harvest for all of our locations. All right, that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer some questions or entertain any discussion or comments at this time. 
All right, Dr. Toich, we did have one question come in. It looks like we got some spotty audio back when you were talking about um, crabgrass. And so the question was, could you clarify um, on the importance of allowing crabgrass to produce seed once during the summer? So, so crabgrass is a, a warm season annual. So that means it has to come back from seed every year. You'll see in this, in this last uh, slide, in the upper right hand corner is my hand with crabgrass seed on it. That's volunteer seed. That will be next year's crabgrass crop. So it's important to let it go to seed once per year and that seed shatters on the ground and then we stimulate that, that, uh, that uh, next year stand in late spring when we smooth those drastically disturbed areas out. Um, and get that crabgrass seed in contact with the soil. All right, and we've got another question. Um, how does crabgrass perform on marginal ground? So crabgrass is actually pretty well adapted to marginal ground. Um, we did some work in Virginia where we looked at uh, the impact of soil acidity on crabgrass, and it's, it's very well adapted to acidic soils. Um, better adapted than a sorghum sudan, which can be a little bit sensitive to acidic soils. Uh, it, it's a warm season grass, so, so it uses water more efficiently than a cool season grass, so it does a little bit better on droughty soils. Um, now it does, all even warm season grasses need some water to be productive during the summer months, but in general, they'll produce about twice as much dry matter per unit of water applied or rainfall. All right, do we have any other questions for Dr. Toich? Well, we do have a um, couple housekeeping notes. Yep, so Dr. Bullock has shared his screen now. Um, so we've got the YouTube link for last week's talk on utilizing technology. Uh, we also have a survey link um, again. So thank you all for continuing to fill those out for us. And if you need the code for CAPE education, we've got that code for this week. It's going to be beef grass. Um, and then join us next week. We will uh, have a two for one special with Dr. Renfro and Dr. Burdon. They'll be tackling what's going on in the market um, that's going to be ever changing. And so we thought it was good to have them come back on and give it or come back on this platform and, and give us an update with where things are at that time. Uh, one more question to come through. Um, could we use crabgrass um, in pasture for rotational grazing? Yeah, certainly. It's, it's like other forage species. It's best adapted um, and it's going to be most productive under rotational stocking. A lot of times crabgrass will be used in uh, finishing systems. So if you're trying to finish livestock on pasture or um, produce milk on pasture. Crabgrass is uh, probably one of the forages of choice. All right, well, if we don't have any last minute burning questions, we thank you all for logging on again this week and we will see you back next week at the same time. All right, thank you, Katie. No problem.